From Barangaroo Studios, the AusBiz COV is the key stuff you need to know about the day in business and finance. Well, welcome to the COB. I'm Juliette Sali. And what has been one of the biggest weeks that we have seen in a long time for not only financial markets, but of course, the world as we continue to react to the outcome of the US presidential election. We also had the Fed cutting as expected overnight and our very own RBA leaving rates on hold earlier in the week, which is what seems like quite a lifetime ago. Let's have a look at where the market finished today. A very solid session. You can see the CBO 200 finishing higher by around 1.1%. Of course, the um, rally in equity markets very much led by what we saw on Wall Street overnight, the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq both hitting record highs and uh, of course that fed through into the rally that we saw on our market to helped out as of course by the Fed's cut too so we're calling it that rate cut rally. The other positive momentum for our market today was a rebound in a lot of the resources players on speculation of more stimulus coming through from China. Still waiting to hear uh, of course officially from the NPC but is it going to be China to the rescue which of course will be another I guess salve in this terms of how we're positioning amidst concerns there could be a flare-up in US-China relations under President Trump 2.0. But that certainly led to a rebound in our resources today, and particularly the gold stocks. We did see gold rebound uh, back above 2700 US dollars an ounce. That US central bank cut uh, as well, really helping out spot in the US session. Let's get through the sectors then and see how we've finished up uh, starting with tech. Okay, we'll start with tech. We saw our uh, zip there up four and a half percent. Really want to look at the miners though, of course, as we do focus in on uh, the resources rally. BHP up one and a half percent, Fortescue up by eight tenths of one percent. The gold players as well, we've got uh, Newmont up 1.4%, DeGray Mining there up by 2.6%, Northern Star up 2%. And having a quick look at the banks as well in a day when ANZ came through with its update, ANZ finishing higher by 1.4%, Macquarie Group down four tenths of 1% today. A quick look at some of the top, top corporate stories. Uh, Block, now it did post a 19% rise in quarterly profit to 2.25 billion US dollars. But that was short of what the market was looking for, and that sent its shares down by more than 6%. REA Group, one of Australia's biggest property classifieds firms, uh, it saw a revenue increase of 21%, shares up a quarter of 1%. Now, of course, News Corp owns REA, or is the parent company, I should say. It came through as well with its uh, numbers. And in fact, the most interesting part was that it was the best quarterly earnings result since the company split into more than a decade ago, a change at the top two for the CFO. Maine Pharma also in focus, uh, reports there from the AFR that um, Australia is exploring a potential sale of the company to interested buyers. And Minres coming under pressure, superannuation giant Hester placing it on its watch list due to governance concerns. We also had Morningstar, of course, issue a downgrade on the stock. Let's get though to our guest today, Shane Oliver from AMP joins us. Um, Shane, I read your note, I read Diana's note, I read me Bowie's note. Um, and I think the, the key point that you guys are making is that we should take what uh, President-elect Trump says seriously, but potentially not literally when it comes to another potential trade war. That, that's right. And of course, that was a, uh, a common saying, I guess, through Trump's first term. It may, I, 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 it's a bit unclear who first said that, but I think it might have been Peter Thiel, um, co-founder with Musk of PayPal, if I re recollect correctly. But, uh, and he made the observation that many of his supporters uh, take him seriously, but not literally, whereas the media, of course, um, uh, take him literally. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so, therefore, when he says a 60% tariff on China or a 200% tariff or whatever, you know, they think that's what's going to happen. Um, but I think we have to be cautious here. Uh, you know, yes, there's a lot of effort going on to try and work out what his policies will mean, but you, you still got to try and work out what he's going to do exactly. And it may not be as extreme uh, as he's been talking about. And, of course, at some point in time, he may back down. It may just be a bargaining um, tool 
uh, maximum pressure, so to speak, as we saw uh, all those years ago back in uh, 2018. So it's, it's very hard to assess which way this will go. I, I think we will certainly see an increase in tariffs, but maybe it won't, won't be as bad as feared across initially share market reaction was was very much a knee-jerk one. You saw the US share market up and the European share market down, which I think partly reflected that view that American shares benefit from the tax cuts, whereas European shares get hit by the tariffs. Obviously, uh, we're going to see a lot of perturbations around that, a lot of volatility, um, but it is just worth bearing in mind that that first, uh, that first term for Donald Trump, uh, you had three good years for shares. I know 2020 was horribly messy, and one bad year, which was, of course, uh, 2018. Um, so one shouldn't get too negative um, on the back of Trump's victory. I think in Australia, you know, when you see polls in Australia, about 70% of Australians would have voted for Harris, 30% uh, or less would have voted for Trump. Um, and there's a lot of negativity and nervousness about him. He, he's not the sort of person you'd normally want to be president of the US. Um, I have those sorts of reservations and concerns as well. Uh, and, you know, you, you, get kind of, you can get kind of depressed about that. But as investors, we have to focus on what it would ultimately mean. You've got to put those sort of personal likes and dislikes aside and, and try and work out what markets will do, uh, and that's a more difficult judgment. Um, but it, it does tell us, if you look back to that period, that it's not, it's not going to be all negative. Well, that's exactly what we're all trying to work out, what it means, because there has been a lot of, as you say, positive positioning and big moves in the dollar and yields as well on the mm. so-called Trump trade. If we do avoid seeing the same kind of trade war that we saw under the previous presidency, which we also have to remember a lot of that was sparked by the relationship between China and the US over the pandemic, perhaps it will be different this time around. What is the overall impact to our market looking forward? Is that just like getting out your crystal ball? Well, it is a bit like getting out the crystal ball. Uh, it was interesting. Yesterday, Michelle Bullock was asked a sort of similar question in terms of what is the economic impact for Australia by, I think it might have been a Green senator. Um, I, I didn't watch it, but I, I've, I've seen reports of it. And then, of course, Powell was asked exactly the same question and, and uh, yeah, both made the comment that we can't set policy on what might be. We have to set uh, interest rates on uh, what we know rather than make assumptions and guesses and all that sort of stuff. Uh, I think for our market, um, ultimately, the key drivers will continue to be what the Fed does, how economies behave and so on. Uh, and then, of course, we'll have to make assessments uh, as, as we see Trump's policies unfold through next year. The 2016-17 playbook was that shares initially rallied uh, right through. In fact, uh, the US share market rallied 38%. We had good years in 2017, including US and Australian shares. Uh, then, of course, once the tariffs started to wind up, it was a lot more negative. Mm. So it depends ultimately on what weight and what timing he puts on those two aspects of his policy mix. But, I mean, our view remains that the broader trend in share markets is up. There is a tendency for when you have surprises, for those surprises to break in the direction of the surprise. Um, so, you know, I guess some people might be surprised that Trump was returned, although the polls were heading in that direction. Um, so I don't think it's a huge surprise, but but to some degree, some people are surprised. And, and that, of course, is broken in the direction of the pre-existing trend in uh, share markets, which was up. Yeah. Uh, and so it's just reinforced the, the already rising trend. But we're going to have bumps along the way. Uh, but for now, for now, central banks, as we heard from the Fed overnight, from the Swedish Central Bank, from the Bank of England, the trend broadly in interest rates is down, and that is supportive of markets even though our own central bank is lagging. Well, that's what I was going to get to because I also read your note after the RBA left interest rates on hold on Tuesday. Since then, of course, we have had the outcome of the US election, a lot suggesting potentially a Trump presidency could be inflationary. Uh, TD Security is now pushing out their rate cutting cycle to begin in August next year. I know you haven't changed your view, but have you changed your view since we saw the outcome of the Trump presidency or you still think that the RBA needs to move faster rather than later? No, we're, we're sticking with our view. Um, as you point out, there's been a lot of notes this week because a lot of things are happening. But um, I, know we, we, uh, I know economists have been flipping it, going all over the place on this, and uh, some were saying May, and then they brought it forward to February, and others were saying December, and they pushed it out to February, and uh, a lot of movement in that. Money markets have been moving around all over the place. There was uh, you know, a rate cut fully 
priced in for next month. Now it's been pushed out. I think it is fully priced in for May now, but at one point in the immediate aftermath of the result on Wednesday, uh, the money market had pushed that out to July. But when I looked yesterday, it's back to May. I, I, I think the RBA will have enough evidence to move in February. When you look at the inflation numbers, uh, what do we have? 3.5% trim mean uh, for the September quarter. For the month of September, it was 3.2%. Uh, that is not that different from the underlying measures of inflation in the UK and the US. Uh, and I, I suspect we'll see more downwards pressure on that over the next couple of months. Uh, and ultimately, we'll see a number uh, for, the, for the December quarter as a whole, which is probably 0.7% um, or maybe even 0.6%. I'd probably lean towards 0.7%, which would see another leg down in the trim mean. Um, on an annual basis, but at 0.7%, but also when you analyse that, you get about 2.8%, which gets us into a zone consistent with uh, with uh, the RBA starting to ease because they said they don't have to wait all the way until we get the headline year-on-year -year number in, in the zone. It's also worth noting that uh, on that chart there, which uh, we, we used earlier in the week, which compares the August forecast, to the one in May and the one in, in now, and you can see that the RBA uh, revised up their trim mean inflation forecast from May to August. And that was uh, you know, when everyone was talking about the potential for another rate hike, or well, some were talking about that. And of course, now that we've seen them go back to where they were in May. So you could argue that you know, the direction of the forecast, lower inflation, slightly higher unemployment, lower economic growth, was a, sort of a dovish move by the RBA on Tuesday, and you could also argue that the failure of Governor Bullock to repeat the line that she doesn't expect to cut interest rates in the near term, uh, you could also say as a bullish sign, they, they are well and truly neutral now. Uh, whereas up until you know, last meeting in September, they still had a bit more of a tightening bias than, a, than, than truly neutral. So I, I think we're moving in the right direction. These things will wax and wane. Uh, we'll obviously have to see what the, uh, the upcoming inflation numbers look like. But, yeah, well, we're sticking to our forecast for the first cut in February. Now, Shane, there's been a lot of emotion this week as well. One guest I had said, regardless of the US election outcome, half the world is going to be upset, half the world is going to be happy. For those that might be feeling a bit glum, how does Shane Oliver sort of, you know, meditate or, or think about the positivity in life? <laughs> Well, I, I usually, well, I, I, re I read a lot of books, but they don't necessarily work for me, but it's mainly music. Um, at the moment, I'm listening to the Pet Shop Boys. Uh, Pet Shop Boys are funny because they released an, a, a song called um, Give Stupidity a Chance, which is one of my favourite songs from the Brexit um, Trump era, the, the first time around. <laughs> Michael Gove said, experts have had their say with the implication now we've got to give stupidity a chance. And, of course, they used a lot of lines from Trump and sent them up. Um, so it's worth checking out the video from that amazing footage from uh, Nikolai Ceausescu visiting North Korea in 1971 on that footage. But in any case, um, I, I, I've been listening to the Pet Shop Boys. A few years ago, they released their B-sides to many of their albums and songs called Hit and Miss. So the song Hit and Miss is, is floating around in my mind at present. So I, I find music is one of the best ways to uh, quiet your mind down and not get too depressed. And if you've got a good song playing, it, uh, it's a bit like meditation or a chant. In many ways, it is. Once it gets stuck in your, in your, your mind as head candy or a crane worm or whatever you want to call it, um, it, it drowns out all these other things to some degree. So I've been listening to the Pet Shop Boys uh, most of this week and that song Hit and Miss, which can be found on a CD or a, a collection on Spotify called Format, if anyone wants to look at that, <laughs> that collection. All right, Shane, always appreciate it. You're always upbeat, a glass half full person. Now we'll catch you next week. Shane Oliver, AMP Chief Economist. All right, getting back to the equity market. Today on the call, the stock of the day was Jumbo Interactive. We had Luke Winchester from Meriwether Capital and Dan Ortiz from the Stock Doctor join Nadine.
But where it's sitting today, back at sort of 17 times earnings when you, you strip out some some non-cash um, amortisation, um, it's starting to look pretty attractive to me. And I think it's, you know, it's for the right investor. It's a slow, steady business. And you see that when you look at their AGM update. Revenue is just a, a nice KGAR trajectory. You've seen that in earnings. It's optimised for profitability, you know, 50% EBITDA margins. This is a business that's, you know, optimised for leverage and, 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 the, and the profit line. They, they do have that issue of, bargaining power of suppliers because they do go direct and have that relationship with the lottery corp for all states outside of wa that's that does you know penalize the stock a little bit but you know at 17 times earnings and you know six percent fully gross up yield we still do think that you know it is representing an opportunity at these prices and the jackpots will turn and like you said nadine the company does a lot of things which probably don't go noticed um which tries to encourage players in its platforms it's always regularly, uh, regularly doing offers and, like you said, some new subscriptions as well uh, for people. So I think it is a little bit underrated from that view and we'd actually call it a buy as well. All right, let's have a look at the market leaders on a positive day to end out the week. Neuron Pharmaceuticals continuing to rise. Also one of those stocks that uh, a lot of analysts say will benefit under a Trump presidency. 14.5% gain today. Strike Energy, Capricorn Metals, Sigma Health, of course, getting the go-ahead from the ACCC with its tie-up uh, with uh, Chemist Warehouse and Life360 up by 4.2%. To the downside today, Block, look, it did come through with a 19% jump in quarterly profit, but it wasn't enough for the market. Blue Scope is a company that many have had on their radar in terms of the Trump effect, but lower today, down 2.8%. Worley, Domain, Karoon Energy also lower. In the small end of town, the winners were Bissaloy Steel, Strickland Metals, Main Pharma, Polymetals Resources and Titomic, while the laggards today in the small end of town included, and Nadine's not here so I can get away with saying this, the Tinder of the music industry, Vinyl. All right, let's have a look at what we are seeing tonight. U.S. consumer confidence data in the U.S. Uh, we might also have a look at uh, what's coming out next week, including the labour force survey for October. Always, of course, a very busy one. Uh, wage price index, NAB business survey, Combank household spending insights. Worth noting that tonight, as well in the U.S., um, ICANN Enterprises and Sony will be among those with earnings. And uh, next week, globally. We've got inflation coming through out of the US, retail sales, China new home prices. Of course, we're awaiting potential further stimulus from China as well. Now, if you'd prefer to buy stocks over socks, the AusBiz Cyber Monday event is for you. You can join some of your favorite AusBiz analysts as they present their stocks on sale. Equities, they say, are undervalued and offer significant upside. That is on Monday, 2nd of December, 11 a.m. Eastern. Register now to watch live or on demand. It's ausbiz.co forward slash cyber free. And just a quick check on where the market is tracking. We are up nine tenths of 1%, just above 8,300 points on the ASX 200. As we round out the week's trade, the SIBO 200 there on your screen up by 1.1%. We're going to be live from the UBS conference next week. A lot of ASX 200 CEOs there, so hoping to bring you a lot of big interviews. We mentioned, of course, the job started coming through on Thursday. Always busy here at Ausbiz. It has been a mammoth week. Hope you kept your cool and, of course, uh, enjoy the weekend. We'll see you from Monday, 9.45 Eastern.